Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to a classic episode of Lunchtime Movie Review on the MHM Podcast Network from our original set of reviews from August 2011 to December 2012. And we are the children of the 80s. Back to lunchtime movie review, where we review the movies from our childhood. But first, a public service announcement. We at the EPA are very concerned about the environment and want to assure the public that we are spending considerable time, energy, and resources protecting your safety. We at the EPA will not rest until the supernatural and paranormal containment units are taxed, licensed, and regulated. We promise to do whatever we can to shut down the menaces to society that capture and secure supposed ghosts. And we promise that another marshmallow incident will not occur in New York City. The views of the EPA are not necessarily the views of the mayor of New York. He hates soda. All right. Peter Venkman, Ray Stance, and Egon Spengler, played by a blues brother and two guys from Stripes, are professors at Columbia University in New York City. New York City? where they study parapsychology, otherwise known as bullshit pseudoscience. You know, like astrology, creation science, chiropractors, homeopathy, and Scientology. Fortunately, one of America's finest universities recognizes the ridiculousness of this area of study and defunds their grant. Tom Cruise finds their lack of faith disturbing. We're going to get shut down (laughs) by Council for Scientology. Unemployed and armed with their passion of ghosts and some nuclear proton guns, they start a small business known as Ghostbusters, where they can be hired to capture ghouls, ghosts, poltergeists, and specters. Their first customer is Dana Barrett, played by Ripley, the panty-wearing alien killer herself. Dana's refrigerator seems to be possessed by Temple of the Dog, Zool. We're also introduced to her quirky neighbor, Lewis, played by Bob McKenzie. Venkman takes an interest in the permed-out cellist and wants to make his own type of white noise with her. Business continues to be slow until they get a call from an effeminate hotel manager and encounters a Slimer. Slimer's kind of like Rosie O'Donnell. It's fat, disgusting, and eats and drinks anything in sight, and leaves an ectoplasmic residue in its wake. They're able to capture this ghost with their proton guns and ghost trap. It's a trap! But Egon informs them what Christians have known for years. Crossing swords is bad. By bad, I mean all life as you know it is stopped instantaneously, and every molecule in your body explodes at the speed of light. They trap the less disgusting version of Rosie and announce discreetly and professionally that they came, they saw, they kicked its ass. Soon, their business is booming as New York City becomes a veritable cornucopia of paranormal activity. They become so busy they hire a non-scientist token black guy to join them, except in this film he doesn't die. They're very progressive. They continue to fight ghosts and are pestered by something even more frightening than any ghoul, the Environmental Protection Agency. Dun, dun, dun. Walter Dickless Peck of the EPA, for no apparent reason, is intent on shutting down the Ghostbusters. Even back in the 80s, the EPA was out to shut down small business. That's right, because Reagan really liked regulation of businesses, especially the small business owner. Meanwhile, back at Dana's building, Lewis is having a tax write-off party, and Dana returns to her apartment. Both are attacked by terror dogs, turning Dana into Sultry Zool, the gatekeeper. There is no Dana. There is only Zool. There is no Dana, only Zool. And Lewis into Vince Clortho, the key master, which is different from Leon, the game master. Yes! <laughs> Leon! <laughs> Zool and Vins are minions of Gozer the Gozerian. Gozer isn't a character from Fraggle Rock, but is a Sumerian god who takes on various forms in order to destroy civilizations, kind of like Obamacare without the death panels. The guys are facing an Armageddon-like moment with the dead rising, oceans boiling, dogs and cats living together in mass hysteria, and thereby ushering in the end of days. 
Before they can combat Gozer and his minions, the EPA and its minions shuts off the Ghostbusters' power, releasing all the ghouls, ghosts, and thetans into the environment, and the Ghostbusters are arrested. In jail, the guys learn that Dana's building was built by a crazy guy in the 20s who built the building as a doorway to Gozer. The mayor allows the guys out of jail to save his vo- to save his voters, and they rush off to meet Gozer, who is manifested as a white Grace Jones, ugly sees no color. She disappears, but announces that the Ghostbusters must choose, choose the form of the Destructor. Unable to clear his mind, Ray tells them he couldn't help thinking about. It's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. So a 10-story tall, Stay Puft Marshmallow Man appears, and the guys do the unthinkable. They cross swords, I mean streams, and the resulting explosion destroys the Marshmallow Man, Gozer, Temple of the Dog, and hopefully Eddie Vedder's career, too. Woohoo! Say hello to heaven, Mr. Vedder. He did, like, one song <laughs> on Temple of the Dog. was mainly Chris Cornell. Yeah, it was mainly Chris Cornell, but I like Chris Cornell. Yeah, well, I don't we really just like lost all of our, like, cred. Lewis and Dana are saved, and the Ghostbusters are victorious, proving they ain't afraid of no ghosts. That's Ghostbusters, essentially. Actually, completely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is pretty thorough. Yeah. Just... <laughs> All right, when did this thing come out? It was released on June 8th of 1984, the same day as the classic Beat Street and Gremlins. Uh, same. Oh. Yeah. So it was a big Gremlins and Ghostbusters coming out in the same week. That was a big week for in, in June. Same month as Once Upon a Time in America, Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock, Streets Ooh. of Fire, which also had Rick Moranis, uh, The Karate Kid, Top Secret, Rhinestone, Cannibal Run 2, and Conan the Destroyer, Greg's favorite film. <laughs> <laughs> no Cannibal fl- no. Run 2. And gay news. Dee, 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 dee. <laughs> no flies on Conan the Destroyer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Any movie with Walt Chamberlain. Uh, it grossed. Goodbye, me. Oh. Go ahead. It grossed uh, over $229 million. It was the second highest grossing film of 1984. It was only behind Beverly Hills Cop, the number one grossing film of the year, and only finished $5 million behind that. Uh, it finished in front of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. It grossed over $50 million more than that wow. film did. And Gremlins, Although that had the whiny screamer. So. Yeah, that's true. Uh, also, it beat out Gremlins and Karate Kid, which were fourth and fifth in the... Ah, oh, that's a big year. Yeah. Nominated for two Academy Awards, Best Visual Effects and Best Song, Losing Both. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. Yeah, and I also read, considered the top grossing family film. The top grossing comedy of all time until Home Alone came out in 1990, and then Home Alone was the top grossing comedy of all time. Okay, comedy, not family film then. Not family film, comedy. All right. Yeah. Because well, Beverly Hills Cop was a drama. <laughs> well, apparently you can pigeon, pigeonhorn anything into being a number one. I, 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 think I thought it was cata- a black movie. It was That's ca- what I say, family no, comedy. It's a fantasy film. It's a fantasy film. <laughs> it's got to have a small percent of something. <laughs> so, well, well, see, I think that makes sense. The black guy I think, was a cop. Come on. See, I think, I think just saying things with confidence doesn't necessarily mean you're right. I'm going back to family film. Makes more sense. Can't just be comedy. Uh, I agree. Thank that's, you. That's what it's, uh, Beverly Hills Cop is categorized as an action movie. I would agree with you. It's probably more comedy than action. Hmm. All right, so what else is going on in June of 84? June of 84, Bruce Springsteen releases Born in the USA. Boston Celtics beat L.A. to uh, win the NBA championship. Donald Duck celebrates his 50th birthday at Disneyland. Woo! Yeah. And uh, number one songs of uh, June of 84. I would have gone to Vegas, you know. I would 50? I go to Vegas, not to right. Disneyland. The whole no pants thing kind of. So, well, that yeah. goes better except off to Vegas. Except when he gets out of the shower. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> number one song for uh, June of 84. Let's hear it for the boy by Denise Williams. <laughs> All right, that is June of 84. A lot going on, including Ghostbusters. <laughs> But this was originally supposed to be a complete uh, SNL cast. Yeah, well, it was a completely different cast. John Belushi was originally supposed to play the Bill Murray role. Oh, yeah, what happened to him? You know, fat SNL alums who are drug addicts don't last long. Um, after he, you know, died, they went to Chevy you know. Chase. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> who wouldn't go to because Chevy Chase? Right? Chevy Chase and Bill Murray are just f- <laughs> 
fucking interchangeable in whatever roles. Well, they're one in, replaced right. the other in Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. yeah, one of them's talented, the other is not. Yes. Yeah, they also went to Michael Keaton, who passed on the project um, to play the Peter Vinkman role. Um, John Candy was supposed to play the Rick Moranis role. I'm trying to think of, uh, wow, any- you can fit in that building. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, someone he, brought a dog to my party. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it'd be, it'd be. I'm the gatekeeper. I'm the key master. I'm kidding. I'm not the gatekeeper. Please don't climb on top of me. He might have been playing the Stay Puft Marshmallow. <laughs> That's about to say. There's no way they're defeating a hundred right. foot tall John Candy. <laughs> they go. Let's hungry. have John Candy do it. But when they thought, well, what would he think of as his dream food? They're like, oh, we were never going to be able to fit that on the big screen. <laughs> Um, and, and Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy, they wanted to play the, the Winston character. The black guy, really? The black guy. They wanted to give him a cameo. <laughs> yeah, he comes in about mm, three quarters of the way. No, through. but they said when it was originally written for Eddie Murphy, he was going to come in right at the beginning and have a lot more screen time, a lot more lines. He was going to be a little more focal point. But then when they didn't get him, they're like, mm, let's push the black guy off to about midway through. So it kind of makes sense. The John Candy part, kind I thought, of was... makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> In Hollywood, it does. In Hollywood. Hey, if we put him in half the film, we're not racist. Come on. Right. Hey, he doesn't die, as I pointed out in the They're summary. all like, who's going to see him on the film? It's dark in the theater. Look, tell me, when when they hired the black guy, tell me you didn't think that guy was going to eat it in the next couple scenes. I I was a kid. I thought black people were just like me. <laughs> so I, I didn't have that thought. <laughs> Matt saw him and goes, finally someone's going to die. <laughs> the John Candy part was funny. I read that he was originally cast for it. And actually had all these ideas. He's like, no, this is going to be great. I'm going to be German. I'm going to have a dog. <laughs> Two dogs. <laughs> Two dogs. <laughs> like, yeah. Little schnauzers. No, that's not going to work, John. <laughs> and he's like, ah, no, it's going to be great. And they're like, yeah, you're out. <laughs> get get oh. the other SCTV guy. <laughs> and then Moranis comes in, who I love. He's great and everything. Yeah, I love that guy. Uh, Dan Eckard was the main writer. And kind of the, in- the original story I thought was, was kind of interesting. In an early draft, when it was supposed to be Belushi and him, it was takes place in the future where there's a world filled with Ghostbusters, and it was very futuristic, and you know it was uh, ghosts were commonplace. And uh, Ivan Reitman sat down with the script and said, "Hey, this if, to make this is going to cost two hundred million dollars. There's just no way we can do it." So they brought in Harold until Ramis. 2012, because <laughs> I think we make two hundred million dollar movies all the time. Yes, we do. Uh, but that was two hundred million dollars, and that day is that they were saying that it would cost that much. So that that would have been the you know most expensive film by far to make something like that. So they brought in Harold Ramis to kind of bring it back to modern time and kind of rein in some of the because uh, they couldn't do it on their own. They were <laughs> stuck in the future. <laughs> How do we get bring this I don't back? Understand. I don't, I just, what do you? <sighs> You want me to make Ghostbusting now? Like we have I mean, to live in like a building, like we have now. But, but we don't. But we don't have ghosts now. I don't get it. But, I mean, but it it calls for a flying car. However, are we going to do this with a non-flying car? Wait a minute. Is there heroin in present time? <laughs> so that's why Harold Ramis. Even that's all Belushi involved. wanted to know. <laughs> that's why Belushi was on. So. Uh, Harold Ramis was brought in just as a writer, and then during the casting process, they they decided he was probably the best one for Ego. They decided, or he decided. You know what, guys? This hey, Egon they, character they just isn't working for time. me. Never mind that I, I wrote it myself. I should do this. <laughs> isn't that kind of what, what he did in Stripes, too? It's no, kind of the same move. In Stripes, he wanted, well, yeah, he did want to play the Boone character, and when they said, now you're too old, he didn't play any No, in Animal House he did that. Sorry, in Animal yeah. House. And Stripes? I don't... I think it was the same thing. He's like, yeah, that's kind of going to be was, mine. Because what else wrote, has he been in, really, other than kind of these ones? I was trying to think of what... These are the ones I know him in. Ghostbusters 2. Ghostbusters 2. Maybe he'll be in Ghostbusters 3. Uh, he, he went to the role of... He kind of went to being a director in the 90s, so he very seldom yeah. appeared after that, so... No, it's kind of... Uh, Kind of interesting. Uh, all right, so what do you guys think about the uh, effects? Any, any, Wait a minute. Are we done on, on the cast part? I think so. What else does there to talk about? I don't know. I'm asking Patrick. Do you want to know who else was possibly cast? With, yes. They looked for... How you did. Egon? No, I didn't oh, talk Egon. about Egon. Christopher Walken, John Lithgow, Christopher Lloyd, and Jeff Goldblum were all uh, considered for the role. 
I oh my gosh, Goldblum. all, all better. You're, yeah, you're I, absolutely right. Yeah. Ramus is like, we just, we, they suck. <laughs> all the other four candidates are terrible. Wouldn't you want to pay money to see Christopher Walken, though? Just yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Patrick no. does a decent walk-in. Go ahead. How <laughs> <laughs> you do that? <laughs> there are ghosts. <laughs> yeah, I got I this. Can't do it. Ghosts. Oh, that was scared. Is that an accent? Sort of. Yeah, so the music in in this, obviously, Ray, what's his name, Ray Parker Jr.? Did some research on this. The, originally, they didn't want him to do this. They wanted Huey Lewis in the news to do a Yeah, because song. when they said, hey, Ray Parker Jr. Jr. wants to do a song for us, everyone went, who the f*** is Ray Parker Jr.? <laughs> it's the guy. He stands on the corner and he drums on the bucket. But the Ghostbusters song does become a number one yeah, in August, song. For, for three weeks, it's the number one song. Wow. Until you pound your head against the wall to get out of your f***ing head. <laughs> yeah. Nominated for best song. I, mean, I was nominated for best oh song. Oh, my gosh. That, yeah, because they, they have to stretch that out even to find songs to nominate. At this point, people aren't writing songs for movies. Take a look at me Wait, now. At this point, they're not writing songs for movies. It's yeah. the same year that Purple Rain comes out, the same year that Footloose comes out. Right. Prince made a movie. Yeah, we know he made a movie, but yeah, they're Prince, making, Prince they're made a movie. Songs are coming from movies that Prince made a movie. So the one interesting thing I thought about the song is it is sampled. It seems like it's sampled heavily from uh, Huey Lewis's uh, "I Want a New Drug." And apparently, Huey Lewis sued his ass. How does that sound? Uh, apparently, you, you weren't the only one who thought that. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> which one? I want a new drug. Yeah, one that won't make me sick. Okay. Love how you said that. <laughs> I did uh, some research and I realized it really sounded like Huey Lewis's song. <laughs> and it just to show I'm right, Huey Lewis thought the same thing and sued him. <laughs> but I've never realized that before until I heard that that he sued him and that he, that that was a controversy. Until then, I started listening back to it and it really does. All right, so it's also nominated for. Well, wait a minute. There's more to this story. Okay. Didn't didn't you say that they wanted Huey Lewis to do this? No, I didn't. Say yes. I said that. Yes. He did say it. They initially asked Huey Lewis oh. in the news to do the song, and they're like, no. Okay. I'm Sorry. Com- I'm committed. I didn't know you already said that. I am committed to Back to the Future. All right, so what else was it nominated for? Best visual effects. All right, so let's talk about these effects. What did you guys think? I at, liked it. Yeah, at the time, <laughs> I think they were really good. Well, we saw it on Blu-ray. Blu-ray. It looked really good to me. Yeah, that's so too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah, I think they held no, up. No disappointment. No, okay. I would, I really, I, I was surprised how well it did hold up. Yeah. The proton streams seem a little dated, but everything else looks pretty good. The which one? The proton streams. You know, oh. nuclear science. Yeah. Dated. But the marshmallow man looks pretty legit. Well, and the and the scenery and stuff, too, even like the temple. <laughs> I mean, after all the marshmallow men I've seen, it looks like a real marshmallow man. <laughs> Listen, you didn't grow up in Indiana, man. You know what I went through. <laughs> no, the, temp- the temple and the scenery and all the, that kind of stuff's pretty good. The dogs, eh, kind of the worst. They're the most kind of yeah. That's the stop motion stuff. Yeah, the animated. Dated, yeah, so. yeah. And my my daughter was watching it with us, my eight year old, and she's like, um, it looks really, it looks cartoony. That looks cartoony. That's what she kept saying about the dogs. The dogs. But other than that, I mean, it's, it's, it does pretty well. So, but it didn't win. No, it lost to uh, Temple of Doom for visual effects. For okay. making the real snakes and real bugs look like real snakes and real <laughs> bugs. <laughs> Well, they had to tear that guy's heart out. Yeah. It was actually just one Indian child that had played many Indian <laughs> children. <so. laughs> All right, what else about this film? Well, what about the ghosts themselves? Which one? All right, like what? Like Slimer. That, That's a pretty funny ghost. Yeah, that, it, iconic ghosts. As far as ghosts go, they're pretty funny. Yeah. I mean, it's like a fat green nugget who just wants to <laughs> eat, drink, and... That's it. And slime. And slime. I thought that was great. I mean that's really funny. Yeah, okay. that whole scene that whole scene's great. <laughs> yeah. I like the whole scene. And it was fun. I did read uh And did they model it after John Belushi? I don't think they modeled it after John Belushi. 
<laughs> yeah. Wow. When he was at the Chateau Mormont, that that's a, what they used to describe. He, you'd find him in the hallway just eating the food off there. It track. sounds like it. And then when you stop and look at him, he runs. <laughs> he chases you while growling. He run you over, and you'd be all kind of wet afterwards. So. <laughs> and then he crashes the party downstairs. No, but that uh, Dan Aykroyd did refer to it as the ghost of John Belushi, apparently. Yeah, I think that's a really funny ghost. Well, the whole scene, I think, is great. When, when uh, just the whole capturing scene is great. Uh, that's my favorite, Dan Aykroyd. Dan Aykroyd is funnier in that scene than anything he's ever been in. He's real understated, but at least he's, at least he's funny. Even Caddyshack 2? <laughs> No, but when you think about Ghostbusters, right, the first ghost they kind of run into is a woman, the shh, the the library, 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 yeah. who's like a person and then turns into a ghoul. But this Slimer character is never a person. It's just a green blob who wants to eat and drink. Yep. That's yeah. funny. Okay. I like it. All right. I, I don't think anybody's disagreeing with you, Jason. No, but no one's like, hey, me too. Oh, that's yes. And I'll Slimer. I hope when they make the third one, it's all about him. All right. Well, and he becomes a critical character in the uh, no, cartoons. No, he was in cartoons. Yeah, in the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, yeah, the cartoon. He becomes like, yeah, their mascot. No, their these, pet. these are the real Ghostbusters. Those are the fake Ghostbusters. Right. Yeah. And he come, make, comes back in the Extreme Ghostbusters, another cartoon that comes out in 97. We'll get to that. <laughs> but the ghosts in this are, are pretty good. So you got Slimer, and then at the end, the, the, the State Park Marshmallow Man. Was that always in the script? Because that is that's really funny shit. I think I think it was always supposed to be Stay Puft. That they had it different. That it was coming out of the uh, the river, kind of like they had the Statue of Liberty in the oh, second we're not film. We're going to talk about but, that. Why well, not? <laughs> not talk about. But that they. But it became. It was too expensive to do that special effect, so they just had it marching down the street. And that's it. great. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. What did you do, Ray? Yeah, and the, <laughs> the angry eyes. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. just an angry marshmallow wanting to smash But he had a smile things. on his face until they yeah. caught him. Until they great. burned him. Yeah. Like a marshmallow. And then the sequel comes out in 89, five years later. Yes. <laughs> and Well, are you going to talk about your stupid cartoons? Um, <laughs> your stupid cartoons? <laughs> they do cartoons after that comes out in 86 through 91. It's relatively successful. Arsenio well, well, Hall. Yeah. Well, there was two, but there was two Ghostbusters cartoons. Yeah, there the was first Ghostbusters, one was Ghostbusters, and then there was the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, but the, well, yeah, the <laughs> Ghostbusters was like this weird one though, with like an ape, and uh, <laughs> we were the originals. Yeah. But then we realized the that there was another originals. Yeah, the G Ghostbusters was like two guys and like this ape who were Ghostbusters. Great ape. And it was only on for like one se season serious? in 86, yeah. yeah. No, hold on, we'll turn it over to Jay, he knows all But this. then the real Ghostbusters were actually the characters. Yeah, you had Winston, you had Vankman, you had Egon, and you had Ray, um, Annie, or the, the whatever her name is, and the, yeah, the, the receptionist, and they kind of are just, and Slimer, and it's just an extension of the, ser the, the movie, basically. Yeah, yeah the movie what? where they lost all their stuff and going into Ghostbusters 2 and they couldn't be Ghostbusters anymore. Yeah. Okay. Just I continued it on. I just Boston like a, ghosts. It was a relatively successful cartoon. In other words, they didn't replace it with an infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> it was on for five years, man. No, it was on for seven years. 147 episodes. Wow. Ran from 86 to 91. Isn't that what I said? I just can't do math. 86 right. to 91. He's that sounds like five, five years. Flunkies. And then the Extreme Ghostbusters comes out as another cartoon comes out in 97. And extreme it's just, Real Ghostbusters? No, just Extreme Ghostbusters. And it's lame. Egon. No, real Extreme Egon, Ghostbusters. The premise is Egon gets a bunch of teenagers to go, to bust ghosts, and one of them's in a wheelchair. That's not extreme. Oh, that's depressing. Yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> were onto something. They just didn't quite hit the mark because if, you, if he's teaching them how to sing, then you have glee. That's right. <laughs> And you have a mega hit. Uh, so but if fun. you teach them to chase ghosts, it's you a fine have a line between. shitty cartoon. Yeah. But then it it yields just a ton of spinoffs with video games and, and different shorts and, and even porn. This ain't Ghostbusters Triple X. Ron Jeremy's in that. I only know that because Ron yeah, Jeremy's, Ron Jeremy's in this one, too. Ron Jeremy is also an extra in Ghostbusters. Kind of funny. I don't know who he plays. I think he plays Vegas. No. <laughs> No, I don't know. Probably Slimer. I don't know. I, I haven't seen it, man. He would play Slimer. That... Yeah, that'd be funny. 
He eats any girl in his sight. I was going to say he just jizzes yep. all over. He sprays ectoplasm yeah, everywhere. Nice. <laughs> but we're not done with the Ghostbusters, right? Uh, maybe. Who knows? So they, they've been talking about making a Ghostbusters 3 since the late 90s, and Bill Murray is very, very, very hesitant to do it because he hated Ghostbusters 2, and they started making that when they didn't have a script. Yeah, yeah. Ghostbusters 2 Yeah, sucks. well, when did he start to hate it? When he read it, when he agreed to do it, or when he finished it, or when it bombed. Well, at the time he was. <laughs> I'm going the latter. Yeah, at yeah. the time he was coming out of, you know, taking a break from Hollywood. He'd made Razor's Edge after this film, and he wasn't the box office draw. So I think he was looking to make a paycheck and didn't really like the project. And now he's always been hesitant to come back and do a third one. And Dan Aykroyd really wants to make a third one. They they had a script supposedly they sent to Bill Murray. He said no. They were going to recast the role and. Now they're back to making a new script and hoping to get Bill Murray involved again. They recently released a Ghostbusters video game a few years ago. That was yeah, actually 2009. Real, yeah, it was really popular, too, and that's how it And got. they all voiced it. Yeah. Even Bill Murray? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Bill Murray was okay. involved in the, that, too. And that was supposed to be a launching pad. That was supposed to be a, the original script for Ghostbusters 3, from what I recall. And the popular of that video game was supposed to get Bill Murray to be go back on board with the movie. But I guess it just hasn't happened yet. Mm. Oh. Yeah, it's so, an iconic film, man. Yeah, Maybe well, if they get Wes Anderson to direct it, but that, that's true. Get, <laughs> get Bill Murray on board. That's true. <laughs> well, he's always been like flaky. That you know, he doesn't sign on. To, so he doesn't sign contracts. He just shows up to a set and you pay him. He's he does whatever he f- wants to do. So. What? <laughs> no, that's he's like Chris Tucker in the Charlie Sheen movie. I don't know you, man. Same time. <laughs> I'm working at a car wash. I don't sign anything. Bill Murray might show up today. If he does, we got to pay him. No, that, that is, supposedly that that is the, the the book on him, and a lot, I've read a lot of. Uh, it's surprising with he should do more black films. <laughs> that you know, like even Zombieland, they were like, "Well, we wrote this part. We we're going to possibly replace it with someone else." And he said he was interested in doing it, and Woody was friends with him. We didn't sign him for it. He just. I wonder what they have in common. He showed up. They said we called him and said we want you here this day, and he showed up, and that was it. All right. Well, let's go around. Jason. Yeah, I liked it. <clears throat> I liked it when I was a kid. I saw it again after not having seen it for years, and uh, I was laughing, laughing harder than I did as a as a kid. I think I enjoyed it more as an adult. Love, absolutely love Rick Moranis in this film. I think he should have more screen time because anytime that guy is in this, I'm already uh, I'm already laughing. The scene, the party scene, just. It cracks me up when he's going through introducing people and giving them their financial information. And apparently that was in one complete take and absolutely... Um, ad lib. Ad lib. Oh, that guy's great. Yeah. Rick Moranis, if you're out there, Hollywood needs you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Honey, I Shrunk the Kids 7 needs to be made. <laughs> oh, Please do that. That is one of my favorite scenes, though, is with him doing that. Yeah, that guy's great in him. it. And I... Uh, yeah, it's definitely iconic. Um a, a classic of the 80s. If they make a Ghostbusters 3, do you think he absolutely needs to be in it? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I didn't like him in Ghostbusters 2, but I do like him. In I'm not one. even recognizing Ghostbusters 2. Yeah, that didn't Ghostbusters exist. 3, if they make it, will be Ghostbusters 2. And then the Ghostbusters holiday special will be. <laughs> <laughs> we just won't talk about that. All right, Jay. <clears throat> You know, I, I like this movie as a kid, and I still like it now. It's actually one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, it's actually the first DVD I bought back in the 90s when DVDs first came out. I like Wow, it. popped your cherry. It did. Um, it's uh, it's just one of the greatest comedies in my mind uh, ever to come out. Um, it's got everything. It's got uh, something for kids. It's got a 10-foot marshmallow man walking down the New York st- City. For the ladies. <laughs> right. It has, a, it has something That's for everybody. Yeah. Ron Jeremy. For the kids, yeah, you get Dan Aykroyd getting a blowjob from a ghost. <laughs> Suck but it up, the, kids. Suck it up. For the adults, you get the uh, little bit more adult or uh, more subtle comedy of um, things are going <laughs> great until Dickless here with turn off the containment grid. You know, I think the, kids are going to understand that. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, it's a it's a it's a family movie. It's a great movie. T- stands the test of time. Patrick, um, I think this film's a classic film. It's I I agree with Jay that is one of the first DVDs I bought back in the late '90s. Um, I love Bill Murray in this. Almost every one of his lines is just hilarious to me. The way he delivers it. And I agree with Matt that I don't have a lot of fondness for Dan Aykroyd, but he is so understated in this film and not so over the top that he actually is very good in the role. I like everybody who's cast in the, in the film, even Harold Ramis. I think he plays the role he's 
given very well. And I, I, you know, I watching this now almost God, almost thirty years later now that this is it, to me is almost like a near perfect film as far as comedy wise that it, it holds up and it's one of the few comedies that I think that I can watch over and over again and I still think is hilarious. But yeah, I do think it stands the test of time. And thinking of like Dan Aykroyd, this is like the first movie we saw him in, or at least. I did that. I could remember because I saw this Dr. before. Detroit. I saw this before Blues Brothers, and I go, man. When I saw Blues Brothers, I go, Dan Aykroyd got skinny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that dude blew up. Greg, so, loved it as a kid. Love it now. Uh, take note, Hollywood of today. It's okay to do a movie with a really good story, really good writing, and good special effects. You can marry the two. It's okay. Give you permission. Uh, and, and I think that's what one of the things that makes And us... keep the black guy alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael Bay needs to direct Ghostbusters 3. The line, the dialogue's great. I mean, it's fantastic. I, I wrote a few things that down that are just hysterical. I mean, Rick Moranis, my favorite line of his, and he delivers a ton of them, but I taped 20-minute workout in my machine and played it back at high speed, but it only took 10 minutes. I got a great workout. I mean, that's, that's just com- comic genius right there. Well, that's it for today's classic episode of Lunchtime Movie Review. Please let us know what you think of the film in the comments section on our website and rate it from one to five stars on that page as well. If there is an 80s film you'd like us to review, please send us an email at comments at moviehousememories.com with your name, your pick, and your location. And finally, if you are of the social media persuasion, you can look the MHM Podcast Network up on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you do, please give us a follow when you find us. On behalf of the whole gang here at Lunchtime Movie Review, thanks for tuning in. And until next time, we have to get out of here and you guys are invited. This podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme song for Lunchtime Movie Review fireworks is brought to you by alexander nakarada at serpentine sound studios.com under a creative commons attribution 4.0 license all original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of lunchtime movie review the mhm podcast network and fuzzy bunny slippers entertainment llc unless otherwise nope.